And a very happy day, ladies and gentlemen. Tim Burgess back with Think and Grow Rich and the mystery part two. Now, we've talked about how the meaning of the word transmute is in just very simple language, the meaning of transferring from one element to another. So we can transmute our thoughts just by changing them from negative to positive. That's thought transmutation. But in this chapter, we're talking about the mystery of sex transmutation. And once again, I had no idea what Napoleon Hill was talking about here. None. Until I started to really dive into the chapter and realized that the physical act of sex and the emotion of sex are two totally, completely different things. Completely different. So let's continue into this chapter. Let's talk about the 10 mind stimuli. Now we talked about how sex alteration, so if we alter the sex glands in man or beast, it completely changes that person or the animal. And it does the same thing to the females. So the next thing he wants to talk about, he talks about the 10 mind stimuli. There's the human mind responds to stimuli. We respond to what stimulates us. He says through which it may be keyed up. We can key up that stimulation. Now the stimuli to which the mind responds most freely are, these are the top 10 mind stimuli. And number one is the desire for sex expression. Number two is love. Number three is a burning desire for fame, power, or financial freedom, money. Number four, music. Number five, friendship between those of the same sex or those of the opposite sex. So basically it's friendship that is in harmony. When, when, when friendships harmonize, that's when they have real power. A mastermind alliance based upon the harmony of two or more people who ally themselves for spiritual or temporal advancement. Number seven, mutual suffering. We've all heard misery loves company, well, right here it is, written in 1937 as one of the top 10 mind stimuli. Number eight, auto-suggestion. That's how we talk to ourselves. You can stimuli yourself with the right self-suggestion, not auto-suggestion, self-suggestion. And then number nine, fear, and number 10, are narcotics and alcohol. He says the desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli which most effectively step up the vibrations of the mind. Now think about it for a minute. When you're getting ready and you're in the mode and you're getting ready to engage, what happens inside? Now, if it's just the physical act of, nothing happens inside. You're just chasing tail. Now excuse the expression, ladies, um, and you, you guys, you ladies chase tail too. Um, but anyway, oh, for those of you that just said, oh yeah, right, Tim. Uh, not too long ago, in a suburb north of Cincinnati, Ohio, a very opulent suburb, the female gym teacher, the female phys ed teacher was taking the little boys home and having fun with them. So yes, it's both male and female who need to learn the art of sex transmutation. I always get that comment when I, when I say yes, you ladies, too. So this desire is so strong and impelling that people freely run the risk of reputation to indulge it. Remember we said that in the last one, in the last video? And here we have a female phys ed teacher. So it makes no difference, male or female. We're all subject to this, okay? So the desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list. Now, eight of these stimuli that he talked about are natural and constructive, and two are very destructive. And obviously, it's the last two, fear and narcotics and alcohol. He says, from this study, it will be readily seen that the emotion of sex, the emotion of sex is by great odds the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. Now think about that for a minute and you'll realize how true and valid that is. We become stimulated. Uh, think about it, and, and I can only speak from a guy's perspective on this one. I'm just not a female, I don't have the right body parts, okay? <laughs> but think about it, guys. Think about when you were in your 20s or maybe your teens, late teens, and you went out to the club. And you went out with the guys to the club, but you didn't out, go out with the guys with the intention of going home with the guys. Okay, 
Now, think about the stimuli. Think about how driven you were to accomplish the end, whatever that end may be in your own mind. I'm not going there. You go there in your own mind. So think about the, the, I mean, the aggression. Think about the drive. Think about the stimuli. Nothing was going to get in your way. Well, what if we transmute that energy during the day and we turn it into our productive energy? We turn it into the energy we use to make the sale. We turn it into the energy we use to assist the person, the energy we use to go about our day. We transmute that energy during the day. We give it the same magnetism, the same charisma, the same enthusiasm that we were getting ready to give it to a less worthy purpose. Huh. And what if we were to do that? What if our golfer friend would have taken all of that energy and put it into his golf game? What if our phys ed teacher over here in this little suburb in Cincinnati, what if that person would have taken all of that energy, she's taking the boys home, getting a little drunk, getting a little buzzed up and having her way with them. What could she have pulled off had she taken all of that energy and transmuted it and given it a constructive, productive outlet? Oh my, Napoleon's on to something here. It really is. He really is. Now, he talks about how when we learn the art of transmutation, that's when we can lift ourselves to the status of genius. See, a genius isn't some, you know, long-haired crackpot. That's not the point. A genius is somebody who has learned, truly, who has learned to control his mind to the uh, direction of anything. That's a genius. See, the reason I, I call Edison a genius, Edison could control his mind and not become discouraged that another one of his methods didn't work out for the incandescent light. See, he had to control the mind, Henry Ford. Now, most of you know the name Henry Ford. And if you don't know the name Henry Ford, please crawl out from under the rock you've been living. I ran into somebody the other day and said, who's Henry Ford? I said, you ever heard of the Ford Motor Company? And went, you mean Ford car? I said, that would be Henry Ford. He started all of that. So, but Henry Ford, he controlled his own mind. He didn't allow outside circumstances to control his mind. And he was absolutely motivated by the love of a woman. That's another thing Napoleon hits on in here. We'll get to it about how we are stimulated, especially guys. I can only speak from a guy's perspective because I am one. We are motivated to please woman. Now, don't get your ego all out of whack. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Yes, you are. We're all motivated to please woman, guys. Come on. And if we allow ourselves to really live from that, oh my goodness, the things that we can pull off. Hmm. Genius is developed through the sixth sense. Now, I want to be the first to tell you that you do not have to understand all there is to know about the sixth sense to utilize it and to profit dramatically from the material in this book. Okay, you don't have to understand it at all. As a matter of fact, when we get to the chapter on the sixth sense, Napoleon will tell us, if you don't understand this chapter, it's perfectly okay. Don't worry about it. He says the reality of the sixth sense has been fairly well established. See, the sixth sense is really the creative imagination. That's what it is. It's the creative imagination. Now, back in the chapter on imagination, we talked about two types of imagination, one being synthetic and one being creative. And the majority of all people, including Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and fast forward to the inventors of today, um, Steve Jobs and the whole Apple thing, they use what's called synthetic imagination. And all they really do is they rearrange old concepts and old ideas into new combinations for a new outcome. That's all they really do. That's all we're doing here. The book well, I didn't think of, the computer I didn't think of, the cameras I didn't think of, the lighting I didn't think of. I didn't think of any of this stuff. No, all we're doing is the team at Maximizing Results has put this together in a different combination. That's all. It's pretty simple when you stop and think about it. However, the creative imagination is something that's much more abstract, much more difficult to explain. So I've come up with an analogy. See, I had to give myself an image to work with to eliminate the confusion. Remember, if we don't see clearly on the screen of our mind, then we have confusion. 
So I had to give myself an image to work with when it came to this thing called infinite intelligence or God and an image to work with when it came to this thing called creative imagination. Now he says creative imagination um, is, is the connecting link between you and I and infinite intelligence or the sixth sense. It's one and of the same. So here I want to draw an analogy for you and see if this helps you as much as it has helped me. I want you to picture a big orange bucket up here. Could even be from that orange construction store. Picture a big orange bucket. Now most of us can see a bucket on the screen of our mind so we don't have any problem seeing this bucket. Now on the bottom of the bucket I want you to see this big hose. And this big hose comes off the bottom of the bucket. And that bucket can be way up in the heavens if you want it to be. It's a long hose. The hose has no um, restrictions on it, okay? So this hose comes off the bottom of the bucket and it attaches, boom, right here. It's called intuition. You ever get a gut feeling about something? You have, haven't you? Where did that gut feeling come from? Well, if it came from the source I believe it came from, why would we question the gut feeling? Hmm, that's a fair question. But anyway, so now we have the orange bucket and we have the hose and we have it connected right here into our gut called intuition. It's connected to intuition. You receive an intuitive idea to take an action. Unfortunately for most people, they receive the intuitive idea to take an action and then they still don't. But anyway, more on that later. So this big bucket is infinite intelligence. It's overflowing with infinite intelligence. You could take as much as you could possibly want and or use in this lifetime and even waste that much again and the bucket still will be overflowing. It's overflowing with infinite intelligence. Out of the bottom of the bucket is a hose that connects right here. So the bucket is infinite intelligence or God. That's where all your answers are. The hose is creative imagination or the sixth sense that connects right here to your in intuition. So when you get the intuitive idea, it came through the hose. Well, wait a minute. What if I'm looking and seeking for answers that I don't have the answer to? And I want to utilize the sixth sense. I want the answer to come from infinite intelligence because I know there is no question here today that does not have an answer. So that answer, when it comes through infinite intelligence, the only reason we don't get the answer is because you and I, through worry, doubt, fear, anxiety, greed, all of those nasty emotions that run around in us, we're taking our hose and we're tying knots in it and we're kinking it and everything else. And then we're saying, oh, infinite intelligence, oh, the infinite one, oh God, please, will you send me the answer? Wait a minute, let me kick up my hose a little bit more. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not going to work. You've got to unkink the hose. You unkink the hose by developing faith. Let's go back to chapter three, the second principle. You develop faith through the rep repetition of affirmation of orders to the subconscious mind. Well, what if a negative thought comes in in the repetition of orders? Well, if you don't blanket that with a positive idea, then you have not transmuted that energy and the negative thought goes right into the subconscious part of our being. So it's vitally important, ladies and gentlemen, that we become very aware of whether it's a negative thought process or a positive thought process that we are engaged in. Are we full of worry, doubt, fear, and anxiety? Because if we are, then we're kicking up our hose. And infinite intelligence or God, as much as they want to deliver the answer to us, they cannot because the system is already set. Um, the system is set to the point where, unless I'm mistaken, this thing, infinite intelligence can't change the system. Follow me on this. An acorn will only produce an oak tree. It's part of the system. An acorn will never grow a maple tree or uh, some burning bush or some flower for your garden. No, it won't do that. An acorn will only produce an oak tree. It's a system that's in place, the laws of the universe. So if we get all caught up in this worry, doubt, fear, anxiety, greed, avarice, superstition, all this stuff, we're just kinking our hose. So let's get involved in faith. Let's get involved in certainty. Let's get involved in knowing what we want. In other words, let's follow the principles of this book, unkink the hose so infinite intelligence can deliver the, the answers or the messages to us and drop them right into our intuition. Now. Nowhere in this book does Napoleon go through what I just went through word for word. Nowhere. 
That's just 26 years of studying this material and creating an image that I could work with to bring clarity so I could eliminate the confusion. He talks about infinite intelligence. He talks about creative imagination in the sixth sense being the connecting link to infinite intelligence. He talks about intuition and the intuitive ideas. He never brings them all together though. My, my mission that I'm on is to simplify this material so you will implement it. Now you have an image, you have an orange bucket that's overflowing with all of the intelligence you will ever need. The hose is the creative imagination. You are in control of that hose. If you don't transmute the negative thoughts to a positive thought, you're putting another knot in the hose. It's just that simple. That's the art of transmutation, ladies and gentlemen. That's the art of transmuting a negative thought to a positive thought. That's the art of transmuting this, this massive urge for sexual contact. Transmute that and give it a constructive outlet through productivity, through enriching the soul, enriching the body, enriching the mind. And you, I know you can do that. And my bet is you can think of a time when you didn't transmute that energy. I'm sure you can think of a time when you did not do that. You didn't, need, you didn't transmute the negative energy to a positive, or you didn't transmute the sexual energy away from the, just the physical act of. And my bet is if we didn't transmute that somewhere along the line, that may have gotten you into it just a touch of hot water. I don't know for sure, but my bet is it has. So this chapter, the art of transmutation, is really, it could be called that. Because if we'll transmute the negative thought to the positive thought, life gets better. Life gets more fulfilling. We end up being happier. We don't sleepwalk through this game we call life. We're on purpose. We have a definite chief aim. We have a set of goals to make sure we reach that chief aim while we live our purpose because we've learned how to transmute the negative energy to a positive. Chapter's really not hard. Just requires repetition of study so we gain an understanding of it. As always, I want to thank Joe. Joe, without you, my friend, we wouldn't be here. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Words will never be able to express the gratitude I have for this man. Never. And everybody on the line, say hi to Joe. Say thanks. As always, one of our strongest desires is that this day be the very best day you have ever experienced in this game we call life. Yesterday is already gone. Shoot, really, 10 minutes ago is ancient history at this point. It's gone. You can't do anything about it. Tomorrow isn't here yet, so the only thing we can do is prepare ourselves to receive the good that we desire. However, right now, this moment in time, we can decide to allow it to be the very best we've ever experienced. That's up to each one of us. Tonight, when you put your head on a pillow, please do so with a mind full of peace. Remember, calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. And may God bless each and every one of you. Have a fabulous day.